Welcome back to the My Aggie Nation podcast. I'm Alex Miller with the Eagle. Uh, this is the video portion of the podcast. So for those joining us online, welcome. Uh, over here is Travis L. Brown. He is with the Eagle covering all things Texas A&M sports. And down below us, the man, the myth, the legend, Zach Taylor, joining us from the Sky Cam, as Travis said earlier on the podcast. But guys, how are we doing today? I'm Good. lovely. Great. You're looking cool. so executive in your in your undisclosed location. It is an undisclosed location, uh, but let's uh, let's let's jump into the action uh, back back in the podcast. Uh, let's let's talk some diamond sports, particularly a and baseball. The last time we were on the podcast, we discussed how a and was kind of getting into this stretch where they really needed to win some games. Uh, Again, a couple of series in the SEC play where they had a good chance to win. Well, they they lost two or three at Missouri, and that started their six game losing streak. They were they bounced back uh, Tuesday at Texas State, but it gets really tough this weekend. Now they're at number one Arkansas. Travis, we'll go to you first. You know, where's this A and M baseball team at, and what do they need to do as they enter kind of this gauntlet that we had kind of alluded to a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, I mean, Missouri and, and Alabama were two teams that they needed to take the series from if they wanted to get back into this race for a good RPI seed, uh, seeding in, in the NCAA tournament. And they, they lost two at Missouri, got swept by Alabama, first time getting swept at home since 2017 uh, against Kentucky. And uh, it was all a part of a six-game losing streak, which was the longest skid that they've had since 2008. Interestingly enough, though, just on a side note – they had actually lost eight straight games in 2008, but still made it to a super regional. They were all at the end of the season uh, and it included two games of the uh, big 12 tournament back then. Uh, but that being said, they're going to need a lot more going their favor this year. If they're going to try to get back into RPI contention, I believe the last time I looked, they were like at 127 um, right now. Uh, it could have changed a little bit. That was yesterday, but um yeah, this this is pretty a pretty historical losing streak. They, um, um, if you look at some of the stats on it during that six game skid, a was batting one ninety eight with uh, eighteen RBIs in through the six games, uh, and then the staff's ERA was six thirty five with twenty four walks and fourteen hit batters. Um, and when you look at when a And M has struggled this year as a baseball team it typically has leaned back to the pitching staff issuing free passes and issuing free passes early in the uh, early in innings, because more times than not teams have made a and pay when there's traffic on the base pass with uh, a zero or, or, or one ounce, which is the mark of, of good teams. And that's exactly what's plagued them through the street. Now they won at Texas state, they turned things around, but they're heading into an Arkansas uh, program this weekend that is going to be in, in contention with Vanderbilt for that number one national seed um, come NCAA tournament time. Uh, and, and they're, uh, not looking to lose any games, especially to an a and team that has an RPI that low with the, um, the, the, the goals and aspirations they have ahead come postseason. So it's been a weird, it's been a weird couple of weeks. Zach, what have you seen from this team? Yeah, I, I'm afraid the Aggies might've missed their window when it comes to racking up the SEC wins, as you mentioned, just going to Missouri and I mean, who would have thought after blowing the Tigers out in that game one, that they were going to end up losing the next two and then you get swept at home to Alabama, a, a decent team, but not a great team. The problem is you're going to be playing some great teams now. I mean, and you talk about the murderer's row. Obviously, you've got top-ranked Arkansas at Arkansas, which is never an easy place to play. Uh, and then you're at home to number three, Tennessee. Then you visit number four, Mississippi State. You host number six, Ole Miss. Uh, you go to Auburn, who's not having a great year. So there, that might be a shot. But LSU is always going to have a lot of talent. And they might be down a little bit this year of the Tigers. But I mean, you're never going to count them out, and even though it is going to be at uh, at Bluebell. I mean, that's still going to be a really, really hard series to win. So I, I think the Aggies might have missed their window um, if they're going to make some noise in the SEC. In the SEC. So 
I mean, right now you're thinking about maybe the SEC tournament. Maybe that's something you're going to do. But going back to what you had mentioned in the pitching, you know, Rob Childers has been great at replenishing this pitching staff. It seems like year in and year out, he's going to have a couple of guys who are going to get drafted high. They're going to be his weekend starters. Um, you know, Bryce Miller has the stuff, but has not been able to perform the way that that they would have liked. This year, I mean, everybody thought, okay, they're gonna they're gonna drop down. They're gonna dip down a little bit in talent. You know, Asa Lacey, uh, you know, had been tremendous. He's a bona fide ace and collegiate level, and now he's gone. So how are you gonna rebuild? And in the past, they've been able to do that. This year it just has not clicked. Um, will it be able to click sometime against these really, really, really good teams? I don't think so. If it hadn't happened yet, I don't think it's going to happen as they go forward. Um, you know, the, the offense has, has performed decently well. I mean, I'm going to say that uh, they've been knocking the cover off the ball every which way but but loose, but they still really looked good. Um, but the pitching is as strange as it is to say, especially about an Aggie team, the pitching just really hadn't been there. Um, and yeah, as I, as I go back to, I think it might be a little too little too late because even if you do play really good ball against these teams, you could still drop two out of three offense. Um, yeah. Yeah. Offensively, this isn't 2019. I know we've talked about this before 2019, the year they went to the Morgantown regional and they went through a, a really dry spell through the sec tournament hitting wise. You, they even admitted themselves leading up to that, that the pitchers knew they were going to have to win these games. And there was a lot riding on those arms to keep the score low because the offense just wasn't going to produce. That was a bad offense. This offense can produce runs. And, you know, when you look at like the, the Friday night game in Florida, what they scored four runs, I believe four runs mm -hmm. is enough to win you a Friday night SEC ball game. It's just the pitching and, and you're, you're, you nailed it with the, the starting pitchers because, you know, I thought that Bryce Miller was going to be a great ace. I thought Jonathan Childress might've slid into that number two role over Dustin signs because he looked like a little bit of a world beater at the end of, of last season when he came back and, and the start and that he had that stuff. Well, I think he's been experiencing a little bit of dead arm and he's moved his way back into the bullpen because he can't find that consistency. Dustin signs has been about the only consistent starting arm and well you can even argue Nathan Detmer um from what he's been able to do has been pretty darn consistent but the the, the difference with this team in years past is that Rob Childress doesn't have a bullpen um he has about three arms in that bullpen that he can somewhat rely on and Chandler Joeswalk, Alex Majors and Mason Ornalis and even at times those guys have been shaky and so he's having to overuse um those three guys, especially Chandler, Chandler Joe's walk um, in throwing Tuesdays and twice on the weekends. And it'll be interesting to see if his arm can, can maintain that kind of workload through the season, because you talk about, you know, if, if the only way to postseason is in the sec tournament, the way that you win those tournaments is with pitching and pitching depth. And I don't know that they have the pitching depth to make a run through a tournament like that, because they, they don't really have the pitching depth to make, depth to make it through a, a weekend series. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, and like I say, it's going to be very telling this weekend. Can they make any kind of noise against Arkansas? I mean, even if you win one out of that series, that I think would be a positive. I know that saying a series loss is it should never be a positive, but with the way that things have gone recently, if you can take one, maybe even two against the top ranked team uh, at bomb stadium, you're doing, you're doing pretty good. So um We'll see, but I mean, especially this year, it seems like the SEC, not going to say that the SEC is never the best conference in baseball year in and year out, but I mean, this year, especially mm -hmm. when you look at the top 10, I mean, I already ran down the numbers of the teams that are ranked that A&M is going to be taking on. It really is a murderer's bro. You could have five SEC national seeds this year um, yeah. easily. Uh, going to that top 16 of, of, of the NCAA tournament. Other thing to look at that we will probably discuss and talk about a lot more as we get on the line, but worth noting that uh, head coach Rob Childress's contract is up this June. Uh, and so we'll be curious to see how a season like this can affect anything with that position moving forward. But like, but like I said, that's a conversation for a little bit further down the line. Alex, what else you got for us? Yeah. You know, uh, Across the way, the a &M softball team, you know, they're hosting Ole Miss this weekend. Um, they beat, they run ruled Sam Houston on Wednesday night. Uh, this, this Ole Miss team's pretty good. And, you know, on Wednesday, I think Cease wrote in a story about how pitcher Mackenzie Herzog, she kind of got a little bit of her mojo back. You know, granted, it's, 
granted it's Sam Houston State, but her last four outings just weren't that great after she had been pitching really well for the Aggies in the circle, really emerges their ace. Um, A&M softball, you know, they're 27-11, they're 5-7 and seven in SEC play, but they've only won one series when they swept South Carolina on the road. And so, you know, you look at where a and going, they've got, they've got a home series against Ole Miss, and then they go on the road at Mississippi State, who uh, I believe is last place. Yeah, they're last place in the conference at 0-9 before they close the regular season with series against Kentucky and Florida, who are both easily in contention for national seeds, uh, or top 16 at least, especially Florida. But, you know, this is kind of a big two-week stretch for – the a softball team to kind of make a move forward, try and get some momentum as they approach the end of their regular season. It'll be interesting to see uh, because of the NCAA announced that both baseball and softball are going to have kind of fixed regional sites predetermined uh, because of, of, of COVID. It'll be interesting to see if, if softball put in a bid um, to host because uh, you typically in years past, you, you get to host by merit. But this might be a year that facilities the ability to socially distanced, have socially distanced areas for people to warm up. The fact that AM has two fields um, that you can social distance for, if they would put in a bid and if they would get it, even if they necessarily weren't in that regional hosting uh, bracket, that, that'll be something interesting to look at. Yeah. And, you know, looking at the RPI, AM's 37th right now in softball RPI. I mean, definitely chances to move up. You know, you 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 sweep a series, you win two or three the next few weeks, go in, try and take a series against Kentucky, Florida. I mean, AM can move its way up into that hosting contention. And yeah, I mean, Davis Diamond's one of the newest, brightest stadiums in the country. It's kind of an ideal place to kind of if you if you wanted to put a predetermined site at hosting for the NCAA tournament. Yeah, you're not gonna find a lot of stadiums that have you know, as many seats, especially in the softball realm as, as Davis diamond does. And yeah, I, I didn't even think about that, Travis, but what you mentioned with the two fields, cause you still have the old Aggie softball complex uh, that you can play some games at possibly if you need to, if you're worried about fans going in and out, that's going to give you more time to clean things up a little bit. Um, it's obviously not going to be, <laughs> be on the same level as Davis would, but uh, that you can still play games there. It's still the same to, you know, close to the same dimensions and everything else. Um, I got to looking, guys, on here and, and just wondering, because these two teams have been year in, year out, you know, they're they're in the talks. They're going in an NCAA tournament. It's almost a no-brainer, I, I would venture to say, because of how often they go. So not counting last year, softball, can y'all tell me when the last time was that Aggie softball missed an NCAA tournament? Are they on a 14 straight streak? Um, Longer years? than that. I believe if you're not counting last year, I was going to uh, guess Oh three or Oh four. 2001. 2001. Okay. Is the last time that Aggie softball did not make it to an NCAA regional. And then for baseball, it was 2006. And that was children's first year. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. That was Rob. That's a, that is a 13 season. year streak. Yeah. Um, consecutive so streak. every year, but one Rob Childress has led the Aggies to an NCAA tournament appearance. Let's see what the uh, let's see what the, the current RPI is on A and M baseball. Uh, you what'd you say? Softball was twenty seven, Alex. Thir thirty seven. Thirty seven. Thirty seven. As long as you win series, thirty seven, you're in. Um, that that that's you shouldn't have to worry there, especially with the 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 amount of comp I mean, what was it? There was years where every single SEC team got in the tournament, or was it all but one? I think a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. I think it was uh, twenty nineteen. I guess. So a and their, their RPI improved with a little bit with that win over Texas State to 115, but that's still well out of the rain, realm of, um, of where they need to be to be able to be in. Uh, you're talking Sam Houston? Attention. Yeah, Sam Houston, lost, sorry. What did yeah, I, what they I, lost what, to Texas what, State. Oh, you're – we're talking baseball. We're talking now, baseball. I'm baseball. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Baseball. I, sorry. I'm, I blame I'm, myself for that because I flipped it back and forth between the two. So I confused myself. So I shifted over to uh to baseball. That's um, right. Softball's got what 37. Is that what you said, Alex? Yes. Okay. It, it, I mean, it's just crazy with the fact that um like projected preseason RPI, AM was ranked 13. And now they've dropped to 115. They had a low of 
127 week four uh, in RPI, which is, or no, excuse me, week two after losing to Xavier, they were 148. So they went from 13 to 148 um, in, in the first week and with Xavier and have, have kind of been in an uphill battle um, since after beating Texas, uh, they were, they got worked their way back up to 60, but the winning streak, I mean, excuse me, the losing streak has not helped them RPI wise. Now, granted, and again, this isn't necessarily an argument for baseball, um, but this is something that even you can point to soccer that we talked about. They don't, RPI is not necessarily going to be such a strong factor in any of these sports committees making these tournaments. It's something that Bird Coon at volleyball talked a lot, a lot about as well, because some schools are playing conference only. Some schools are playing that they can play some non-conference and not. And if you're if your school in a good conference that's playing conference only, your RPI is just naturally going to be better. And you or or if you're playing conference only and you're in a group of five conference, you might not even have a chance to raise your RPI because you're not going to play any quadrant one or two teams potentially. Right. So the the committees have to look and evaluate a little bit more by eye test this year. Um, because that RPI is a little bit misjudging since some programs won't have the opportunity to schedule higher RPI teams if their conferences don't allow, or some will only play high RPI teams. Therefore, that will skew the numbers in favor of them. Yeah, and not saying that non-Power 5s can't be on television or a stream, but obviously Power 5s, uh, at least when it comes to the Diamond Sports, are more readily available on the four-letter network and places that folks can watch them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, COVID, even, even though teams are playing right now, COVID is still making a huge impact, obviously, on the, the fans and everything that goes along with the COVID-19 protocols, but also in the postseason. That, you know, that dovetails into something else that I've been interested in and wanted to talk about a little bit, and that's um, now that immunizations for COVID-19 are opened up to uh, everybody 18 and older in the state of Texas, that seems to be the key towards – bringing back a more normal college athletic seasons where you're not having to worry about, well, it's a day before day, two days before a game. Is this game going to happen? Are we going to have to quarantine? Um, you know, what's going on with that? Immunizations seem to be the way to make that happen. It, it, I, I know there is some co kind of company policy legalese with a lot of these coaches saying, well, it's certainly up to the players to, to make that choice for themselves, which good uh you know that is a health decision but is there any concern that if enough players elect not to get the vaccine that these situations of quarantines and minimum numbers to to participate in games getting canceled because of COVID-19 is going to continue on longer than we've maybe necessarily thought with a vaccine coming out well there's a there's that possibility for sure um you know I'm Again, we're not there in the locker room. We can't hear a lot of those guys speaking with the, one another and, and get their thoughts uh, or their feelings. But, you know, a lot of the players that we've talked to, or at least Jaden Peavy, I know, was, was seemed like he was a pretty big advocate for going and getting it. Um, and I would think that there's quite a few other players that are willing to do it as, as well. Now, if there are players who are kind of hesitant and they're balking on it, and then you start seeing games being canceled, games being postponed, whenever the COVID-19 protocols are still popping up and still wreaking havoc on the schedule, if that does continue to be the case, then I think you will start seeing more players saying, okay, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and get the vaccine. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I understand that there's some trepidation and just in the general public, not even talking about athletics, but just in the general public about people possibly getting a vaccine that, that has been put together for so quick. But I like, I really like when you posed that question to Jimbo Fisher last week, I really liked his answer. You know, I know that is, is kind of legalese, but he said, basically, we're going to provide these guys with as much information as we can. We're, it's not a deal where we're saying, all right, do you want the vaccine or not? We're going to say, here's what's available. Here's what you can expect as far as possible side effects. Cause I know it's, people that I've talked to that have gotten it, it's treated them differently. You know, some have kind of had some, you know, been, been having a, a feverish symptoms, that sort of thing following the second, the second shot, you know, here's, here's what we know about it. Here's what you can, you can learn from it. And then allowing those individuals to make decisions um, at least at this point, I think is the, is the right move. Now, as I said, 
if it does come a time where games are still being canceled, things are still being postponed, um, you know, and, and also too, if you're going to talk about contact tracing, I mean, could you say if a player that has not received the shot gets COVID, but has been hanging out with players who have received the shot, are they still going to be forced to be quarantined? Yeah. And I don't know. And, and, and it, it'll be interesting to see if the universities keep a track of how players will be immunized because uh, I, I talked with Ross Bjork a couple weeks ago, just about some of this stuff. And he said, initially, this was several months ago that they're not sure yet if they were going to track who has been immunized or not, but that seems like something that would need to be important because of those issues, those, those issues. But again, and there's a lot of science and a lot of things that are well above our pay grade on how this works. And if we're going to need boosters, if we're going to need to get the vaccination once a year, like a flu shot, how long the vaccine, the vaccines will last. But yeah, it's just curious. To, I, I would love to be a fly on the wall in some of these locker rooms to see how these coaches are treating, um, passing along this information, like you've said, um, and in giving the, the, the players the, the, the best information and, and the best and what their advice is on these issues moving forward. Well, and something that, you know, could end up superseding all of this is the thought of our universities just going to require students to have to have gotten the vaccine before they return to campus. You know, I'm reading an NPR article right now and Duke University and Notre Dame have already said, hey, we're, we're going to require you all to get the vaccine before you come back for the fall semester. You know, it lists several other universities and they're mostly private schools, but, you know, vaccination requirements are have been commonplace for universities for years now. I mean, I can remember getting a meningitis shot before I went to A&M as a freshman. And so, you know, it, it, I'm curious to see if, if the universities will – have to require students to get it before they can come back for fall classes. That'll that'll be interesting, and not to get too de delf into too dip too far into politics because that's not what we necessarily do on this podcast. But uh, Greg Abbott, you know, has already come out with executive orders saying that you they're not going to allow um, vaccinating passports and those kinds of things that that make you have to determine if you've gotten it or not to get into let's say a sporting event or a concert or or work or something like that so i'd find it, it would be probably be a pretty tough uphill legal battle in the state right now for any public state schools to try to have to try to require vaccines for students to return that that, that i'm not saying that it wouldn't happen but there'd probably be some pretty good legal battles back and forth on that before something actually concrete sticks yeah, would be interested to see if any of the private schools in Texas start requirements. Um, you know, um, again, I know that there's going to be people that are all on all sides of the spectrum, but it is kind of crazy, like Alex just mentioned, how many vaccinations, because I remember, you know, going before public school and, and saying, hey, you know, you need to be sure that you're up to date on all of these shots. Now, I think what people might have uh, a different opinion in getting, say, like a tetanus shot versus getting a, a COVID vaccine is the fact that the vaccine for COVID is, is so new um, and was put together so quickly. I guess that's why it's, some individuals might balk at it. But um, yeah, I, I have a hard time believing though that having a requirement or like you talked about a COVID passport, a vaccine passport uh, would, would fly, especially here, uh, given what the governor has said and you know the fact that A&M is a public university. So uh, I, I don't really see that happening, but, but like I said, I think the players will end up making that choice because if things continue to be canceled, things continue to be pushed back. I, I think that players will eventually say, Hey, look, we're going to have to get this or we're not going to be able to play regularly the way that we're used to. Um, I agree. So I, I think that eventually the, the market will decide, so to speak. I agree. Alex, you got anything else for us? I think we covered all the bases today. Y'all, y'all, y'all excited for spring game? Y'all excited for spring game flag football halftime extravaganza? Who isn't excited? Johnny Manziel get, playing quarterback for both teams. Yeah, and we get to go see stretching on Saturday too. Did you guys? We get do that go email? get to see stretching. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, they're finally opening up one of uh, AM's spring practices for the midja to go out and uh, watch. So we'll get to see some good stretching. Maybe get to see the okay. 
we, we make a lot of fun about going to spring and fall football practice because in essence, when you're in the AM media core and you go do this, you see the same, mostly just the team stretching, maybe a few field goal kicks and then a few of the same individual drills every day. So yes, you know, if, if you're a big diehard fan of the team, you, you might, but there's not a whole lot to gauge from it. We can't necessarily make it draw any huge conclusions from what we see um, case in point with how much um, Tim Br Brewster was on Jay Sternberger two years ago in, in, in spring and fall practice. I thought he was going to be a bust because he was just dog cussing him left and right up everything, but it worked and he turned out to be the spring MVP and then went on to have such a great season at, at A&M. So case in point, you don't get a lot, but that all being said, I miss the days, the, the greatest days of watching spring practice were the days of Noel Mazzoni and the trash cans with the holes in them. When, the, when he, the quarterback drills literally just consisted of like a trash can, like duct taped onto another trash can with a hole in it. And the quarterbacks just doing like the Dr. Pepper scholarship contest before practice every day. That was peak spring fall practice watching to me. All the good days, the but good days. Is there is there a drill, or a or a or a, a part that just really sticks out to you that this 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 is this is the epitome. This is what makes this spring and fall practice. Um, you know, you were talking about a few a few field goals, a few tackles, a few expletives being thrown out there. That's always a little bit fun to uh, uh, to hear. You know what uh, what might come out of Jimbo Fisher's mouth. That's always uh, fun to to kind of be there and be part of that so yeah like you said it's very limited you know that or or whenever you almost you see your life flash before your eyes when there's a play that's coming in to wherever we're standing and suddenly all the unathletic media members disperse like the parting of the red seas so that's always fun to watch hey i will i will say this though this is the first time that anum has opened up practice to the media since i'm pretty anum didn't do fall or spring practice last year they didn't open it up fall last mm -hmm. year. So this is the first time in a year and a half yeah. that we will have been able to go. And fall so, of 2019. Um, it's been too yeah, long, boys. It's been a long yeah. time. And, you know, it, it's hard for us to cover the team. Like we said, we're not in the locker room. We're, we haven't been around the players as much as we normally are. Um and so hopefully this is a step forward getting back to normal as far as access is concerned um, and providing as good of content as we can provide with the access we're given. So He's so, he's so youthful and unjaded, Zach. So youthful, so <laughs> bright-eyed. The world he, he is, is still his oyster. He just doesn't get it yet. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with you, Alex. That, that is very true. Um, I mean, Robert Sess is 35, guys. Just keep that in mind. That's what it's done to him. <laughs> yes, exactly. But each year, the bill of his hat grows longer. With each <laughs> spring and fall practice, he uh, he has to endure the bill of his, his hat. Sand, his hat. Sandlot hat. <laughs> yes. Pretty yes. sure he's that kid. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, he is that kid. Well, yeah. Um, lots of lots of fun to be had as we watch um, socially distanced spring football. Get an idea of what we're going to pontificate on for the next three months with seeing, you know, 15 minutes of quarterbacks throwing who has yeah. the stronger arm, who can hit the most trash cans. I wish well, that was still it, a thing. You know, that's uh that is not always indicative because everybody would have said Nick Starkle had the stronger arm than Kellen Mond. Mm -hmm. well, we know how that worked out. Well, and everyone probably would have said Nick Starkle had a stronger arm than Trevor Knight. Yep. That's Cause too. I think that was the Trevor Knight uh, year was the, uh, was the was the Dr Pepper contest trash can holes, <laughs> you know. Anyway, well, I do we, yeah. Remember, remember that one time on the podcast when we tried to do bits. This one time on the podcast, yes, we did. Yes, bits, where we just basically we, played Noel Mazzoni bits. We played that, his uh, jokes with a laugh track and called it the College Station Comedy Club or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was in the uh, podcast infancy. I believe I still have some of those. Those were those were the those were the good old days. Well, days. I, I don't actually think those made it over to the conversion to Apple Podcasts, so maybe it's gone and lost forever. Darn, 
hard. Well, and everyone's it's another podcast in the book. There's no bits on this one, just real hard hitting sports facts. <laughs> For uh we'll we'll be back next week. We'll probably get into a little bit of draft talk. Oh yeah, draft it is talk. Up so uh that's coming up. We'll get into that. Those uh big baseball series this weekend and continuation of spring ball as well as softball. So tune into those things. Uh, and we will be back for Zach Taylor and Alex Miller. I'm Travis Brown. This is the My Nation podcast. We'll see you next week.